At the end of the last section, we did look at the networks that we're going to be using in this floating static route lab. Just to quickly review, the frame is always going to be the same throughout the course, 172.12.123.0-24. We've got a direct connection not running rep between routers 1 and 3 on the 210.110 network, and we've got an Ethernet segment as well, 172.12.23.0-27. Going to give you a bit of a pop quiz here too in just a moment when it comes to that direct connection between routers one and three. We also discussed some reasons why we might do this kind of thing, why we need a floating static route. Maybe that bandwidth availability between S0 is much higher than that of the S1 link, but RIP is going to see them as equal. Maybe the S1 link is considered unstable. Maybe your client is considered unstable. I am just kidding. But maybe the client just doesn't want to hear anything. He just says, look, and, we, and we've all been there, just says, look, it's always been this way, and this is the way I want it left. So, you know, we have to be flexible in that kind of situation because uh, we can't always just tell them that we're going to do whatever we want to do. So let's take a look at this network. And first off, before we even hit it, let me ask you this. We've got a DTE DCE cable in our lab connecting routers 1 and 3 at the S1 interface. What command did I run from here to see which end of the cable was the DTE end and which end of the cable was the DCE end? And you're a CCNP. Uh, let me ask you another question. Why do I care? Why do I care? What does it matter? I'm not even going to narrow that down for you any further. What does it matter? Let's take a quick look at that. The command that I'm thinking about is show controller. You have to watch this one. It's really weird. It's still the only command I've seen where you can't put the interface type and number together. It really threw me the first time that happened. And don't worry about all of this. This is more uh, Cisco tax stuff um, support that you might need one day. What we're interested in is this part right here shows you which end of the DTE DCE cable is connected to that particular interface and the reason I care is because that's where I have to put the clock rate command remember because otherwise we're gonna have serial one is up line protocol is down the DCE end of a direct connect directly connected serial interface such set up like we have here the DCE end has to give that clock rate so now that we've reviewed that on top of everything else let's take a look at the routing table period on router one and I left all the static routes and the loopbacks from the last lab on there because they don't affect this one and again you can already see you know this is a lot of information we really don't need all this we don't need the codes right now and as this table gets larger and larger and it could go you know totally off the screen and I've certainly seen them like that you will want to narrow your focus a little bit and I would really recommend getting used to using your protocol name here or even the network itself that you want information about. So show IP route RIP gives us only our RIP routes and you can see that it's got connectivity to that network and we're seeing load balancing right now through the cloud because again we're not running RIP over that direct connection and again you can see this timer will never go over 30 seconds if no one has messed around with the timers because that's how old that route is and you can see it went all the way up to 29 and I bet it flipped right back and there it goes to two seconds so let's take a look at our network then and what we want to do is bring the serial link here up if those rip routes for whatever reason leave the routing table so what we can do is create a floating static route and it's going to be the same command or the same syntax, I just say 172.12.23.0. Then you put your mask 255, 255, 255, to what? What is a 27-bit mask in decimal format? It's 224. I'm going to specify in the next top 210.113. That's router 3's serial 1 interface. And that's a legal command, so I'm going to go right there and hit create and have I accomplished my objective? What's that routing table going to look like? We don't see any console messages, but what's that routing table going to look like now? Hmm. Looks like those RIP routes are gone because of course anytime we run a show command on a Cisco device and it skips a line and drops us right back at the cursor, that means there's nothing to show us. We do have a route 
but it's not the one we want because the rule here is and what we got from the client or the exam question or what have you is that we only want this route to enter the routing table if the RIP routes are not available and that hasn't happened here. What is happening is that now we have competing sources for the same network. This router is learning about the 172.12.23.0-27 network from RIP. We know that because we just saw the routes in the routing table. They're not being put in the routing table now though because we wrote a static route that matched this exactly so we go and we end up going to the administrative distance for a tiebreaker. Well you know the administrative distance for RIP is 120 and for this static route it's 1. So the static route gets put in the routing table and the RIP routes aren't going to be put in there. That's why we have to create a floating static route. What I'm going to do first is get rid of that route and I'm not big on keystroke shortcuts as a lot of you know but what I like to do there you can do your up arrow just to go through your command history then do a control A to move to the front of the line just type the word no so for those of you who hate to type you can just do that and I'm going to do a quick write there and by the time that gets done rip should have put those routes back in the table it's not going to be instantaneous it's going to be a few seconds both the save and the rip uh, catch up so to speak. Let's take a look. Show IP route rip. By that time the routes are back in the table so I'll show you the whole thing. So now we see what's going to happen if we put a static route, a regular static route, right back into this table or on this router. It's going to get rid of the rip routes because the AD of the static route we just wrote is so much lower and it only has to be lower by one but it's lower than that of the rip discovered routes. We just have to change one little option in that IP route command. Let me up arrow to that and let's look at our options here at the end. Distance metric for this route, that's actually the administrative distance. That's a little misleading, isn't it? Distance metric, it kind of makes it sound like you know, you're setting a hop count, but you can take a look at 1 through 255 and say, well, okay, that's not the case because there's no way it's going to let me set a hop count of 255 because 16 is infinity, so 255 is uh, infinity and beyond. So what we're going to do for distance metric for this route is set the administrative distance. If we wanted to get cute, we could just put 121 because we know that's just one higher than RIP. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's not put 200. Put 121 in. And there is no impact, hopefully right now, on the routing table. The router is not going to give you any message that says you just wrote a floating static route, anything like that. But what makes it float is changing the administrative distance of the route. So right now it is kind of floating in limbo. It's just floating out there. It's in the router, but it's not being used because it's a direct match for this network. But now the RIP route is winning the argument because its AD of 120 is lower than that of the floating static route AD of 121. So, since we're in a lab, you know what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and close serial zero off. What we'll do, that will, that will cut off the RIP updates coming into router one, period. So let's do that and see the result. It's going to be ugly, yep. Serial zero goes to administratively down. We know that means it's been manually shut down and of course if it's down there's no if it's down physically there's no way it can be up logically and that's why the line protocol goes down immediately so let me run show IP route and there's our route static route to 172.12.23.0 and via 210.113 and you see the administrative distance of 121 you'll also note I believe we lost some other routes we lost the route to the loopback on router 2 because of course that next hop of 172.12.123.2 is now unavailable. So that's another route we lost even though it was a statically configured route. So that is how a floating static works. We still have connectivity to 172.12.23.0 but now it's over that serial 1 link. Now what happens when the RIP routes come back? Do we have to do anything special for the routing table to clear itself of the static route? put the rip routes in? Let's find out. 
Let's find it together. Because I don't know either. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but let me do a no shut there. And of course, it's going to take a moment. And this is live equipment. Sometimes you do get a surprising result. I bet we see more than one of those before the end of this course. Advanced routing? You bet. Line protocol and serial zero. So that's going to take a moment. Don't see anything yet, but don't expect RIP to act terribly quickly. Because with EIG, RP, and OSPF, we'd probably already see these routes. Just about the time you get nervous, that's when you start seeing the RIP routes come in. And there's one of them from dot three, so we haven't gotten one from dot two yet, but we will in a moment. He said, hopefully. And there it is. So dot two just took about 15 seconds longer to get in because those updates are just being broadcast every 30 seconds. And a little bit of a time difference there with RIP, but we're used to that by now. But that's how floating static route works. That's how helpful it can be. It really does help serve as a nice backup for your dynamic routing protocol. When you hear the phrase on demand, you know, it brings to mind something. I mean, really, when you think about it, it's an amazing world we live in. You know, you can watch these videos on demand on my website in a matter of seconds. Go to your cable box, call up on demand, hit one button, you're watching a movie that hasn't even been made yet. When you hear on demand, you do tend to think of immediate and the latest and the greatest, right? Well, there's always an exception. ODR is that exception. This isn't exactly the cutting edge of technology, but I do want to mention it to you. You'll see it every once in a great while, and it can be helpful in the right situation. Because again, everything we do on a router or a switch has a cost. You know, cost in CPU, cost in memory, cost in time. Our time and the router's time. Well, especially with dynamic routing protocols, that's especially true. And with, in, with small networks with routers that don't have the resources to spare, and we've been there. I mean, I've worked in networks where they had EOL routers, you know, they've been end of life for years. Cisco wasn't supporting them, but they might have been at, you know, real outlying spoke locations and the client didn't see any reason to spend any money to upgrade it. So what we'll see, especially with EIGRP and OSPF, we're going to talk about the benefits of using stub routing. And that's where you're really introducing a default route to a certain area of the network because that's all it needs. ODR is kind of like that. Uh, ODR is technically not a routing protocol because the only thing we're really sending are some prefixes. Let's talk about how this operates to begin with. This is Cisco proprietary, by the way. So if you're working with that dreaded multi-vendor environment, ODR is not a viable solution. Also, the only type of network that you can use ODR with is a hub and spoke. That's it. And again, it does support VLSM, so you're OK there. What basically happens here is that the spokes use ODR to send directly connected network prefixes to the hub. And that spoke will use the IP address of the hub on the common link as its default gateway. So then the spoke router may have 50 different places it needs to send data, but it only needs that single default route because the next top IP address is all the same. I think I've referred to that phrase a couple of times already in this part of the course. And again, when we talk about stub routing with EIGRP, and especially stub and total stub and not so stub with OSPF, you'll see that we often have routers that have that situation. They may need to reach every router in your network but the next top IP address is all the same. So what we're always interested in, it's a phrase you'll hear me use throughout the course, we want to keep those routing tables complete yet concise. They have to be complete. If we can't get to the destinations we need to get to, keeping it concise isn't doing us much good. And ODR, again, can help in certain situations. Uh, I don't remember the last time I saw it in a production network. It's been a while. I mentioned it here really for completion's sake more than anything else. I think you're much more likely to see a brief mention of it on your exam than you are in a production network. But just in case, a couple of rules to remember with ODR is that you've got to have CDP running because it actually uses Cisco Discovery Protocol. That's why it's Cisco proprietary. It uses CDP to actually get those prefix updates to the hub. So if Cisco Discovery Protocol isn't running, then you're, you're just dead in the water right there as far as ODR goes. And you remember how to check that, show CDP. 
and there's your global CDP information. And if you were not running it, then it would just say, you know, CDP not enabled. Let's play around with that just a little bit. That's from your so CDP and CDP run is the global command. And then if you run show CDP, it's going to tell you CDP is not enabled. Okay. And that's it. So it's CDP run. Do you remember what it is on the interface level though? It's actually enable. So the word is slightly different. They, they used to be a little crazed on that in the NA. I don't think they are anymore. But it's just simply enable or no CDP enable or CDP enable at the interface level, CDP run or no CDP run at the global level. And that's really all there is to on-demand routing. You enable it with a router ODR command and you just go from there. But again, the keys you can only use in a hub and spoke network. You can only use it in a Cisco proprietary network and you can you uh, need CDP to be running. You're, you see CDP cut off so often now, speaking away from this topic a little bit towards security, you see Cisco Discovery Protocol turned off a great deal now because it does present certain security vulnerabilities. So that's another reason you won't see ODR as often and frankly EIGRP and OSPF in particular do such a good job in covering all the stub routing possibilities that you really just don't need see the need for ODR that often but I do want you to know about it and know that it's out there. Key though is that you will definitely be seeing some floating static routes out there in today's networks, no doubt about it. You should definitely be ready to configure one of those for your route exam as well. That really concludes our fundamentals review. See, that wasn't so bad. Uh, but I really do appreciate you taking the time to watch this particular part of the course. I know we want to get to the meat of it with multi-area OSPF and everything else. But without these fundamentals down, uh, you know, the intermediate and advanced information really doesn't do us a lot of good. So just Watch this one as often as you need to. Make sure you are crystal clear on your static route configs, your floating static route configs, what makes them a little bit different, and of course your administrative distances, you got to know those cold. So just have all that down, and I will see you in the next section of the course.